girl a girl? Is it chromosomes, genitals, or an undescribable sense of who one is? Tonight we're going to explore how we perceive gender in our culture and the present and future of the transgender movement. My guests tonight include one of the leaders in sex reassignment surgery, Dr. Marcy Bowers. In 2003, she took over for the legendary Dr. Stanley Biber in Trinidad, Colorado. She is an OBGYN who splits her time between her practice in Seattle and her work in Colorado. Welcome, Marcy. Well, thank you, Fawn. Glad to be here. Excellent. Uh, we also have with us Nicole Garcia, one of our very own volunteers here on Colorado Outspoken. She has recently undergone her own sexual reassignment surgery with Dr. Bowers and is here to share her journey of gender with us. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you, Fawn. It's great to be on this side of the camera. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> well, Nicole, why don't you start by telling us how, how you ended up seeing Dr. Bowers? What kind well, of brought you to that? Dr. Bowers um, attends several different com conferences throughout the United States, and one here in Denver is called the Gold Rush. I met uh, Marcy about two years ago at Gold Rush, and she, between meeting her and performing surgeries on different, um, several of my friends, I think you've done, Marcy's done three surgeries on friends that I know and have gone down to see um, how it's all performed, and I had so much confidence in her. So you had models for, behave, for, for the, the whole process. Yes. Um, I saw her in action. I saw her down at the hospital after the surgeries. Um, I've seen her work, uh, to be very upfront. I've seen <laughs> what she does, and she's very good. And she's also an incredible person. Excellent. What made you decide to get the surgery? Um, for me, it, it was right. I, I adhered uh, strictly to the Benjamin standards of care. I went through two years of uh, therapy with a therapist who specializes in the um, transgendered issues. I also went through hormone replacement surgery, or, excuse me, hormone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. So I was on spironolactone to suppress testosterone. I was on estrogen and progesterone to uh, increase the female um, features. And I was finally at the point where financially I could afford it, and I had reached a uh, the pinnacle of my transition where it was time and I was lucky enough to be able to be scheduled and had my surgery on November 11th. Congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, Dr. Bowers, why don't you just kind of walk us through what Nicole's surgery was like? Well, I think um, viewers uh, still, uh, despite more knowledge in the public, still have this idea that we somehow just chop off the, 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 the member, if you will. Um, so no, in, in contrast to popular belief, we don't use a box cutter or anything like that. That's good. That's, That's good. a good thing. No, we, we remove the, the hormone producing structures, the, the testicles, and then um, the uh, part of the scrotum is used to line the, uh, the inner part of the vagina. And then the penile skin is used to line the remainder and then um, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, males and females are indistinguishable uh, anatomically up until about the early second trimester uh, as they're de developing. So the tissues in boys and girls are very similar. So simply reusing those and reassigning them in, in uh, surgery is not that difficult to do and that's really what we did in Nikki's case. So you tried to keep as much of the tissue as you could. That's right. To keep the natural tissue. And we just rearranged the deck chairs pretty much. So. <laughs> rearranged all the inside. Yes, yes. Do you find that there's uh, a lot of your patients have a great deal of sensation when the surgery is over? Oh, yes. And, and again, that's an important advance that has happened along the way is that it's recognized that if we preserve the same nerves and arteries, um, that innervate the, the, the analogous structure in, in natal females, in other words, the clitoris, um, by using part of the glands of the penis, 
we can keep those nerves and arteries together and so sensation is very similar. Um, nothing is quite as densely innervated as the natal clitoris, but we come very close. I bet. Mm, <laughs> Are you happy with the, the results? I'm very happy. Um, I, she's done a wonderful job and there is significant sensation. <laughs> you have a good smile on your face. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, most people are more familiar with the term sex reassignment surgery, but I know you prefer genital reassignment surgery. Would you tell us a little bit about that change for you? Well, uh, this is a new phenomenon in, in society, and so I think it's, it's, it's important. For some reason, it seems to evoke fear in people's minds. Mm -hmm. And so, um, really, though, for, for individuals who are affected by gender dysphoria, um, it's important to remember that you really, you can't, an individual can't catch gender dysphoria. It invariably, when I talk to people, it is present since the very, early, the very earliest age of recognition. So ages four, five, and six is typical when a person begins to feel that they really are um, not necessarily the gender that they were born with based on genitalia. So if you're born with a penis, Nikki, I guess, right, would you say, felt like a girl. Exactly. But I, I fought those feelings tooth and nail through my uh, entire adulthood and into, into my 40s. So it was really never about, it was, see, it was really never about sex. It was about one's identity. And the identity is what's in your brain. So the gender actually was very stable. That, that idea of gender that's was very right. stable. Um, but the, the genitals changed, and that's about it. That's right. So that's why some people call it gender reassignment surgery, but mm -hmm. you, see, you see, gender really doesn't change if you, if you understand that it starts from such an early age. And it's just we're, we're realigning the, gen, uh, the genitalia. Yeah. So I prefer the term genital reassignment surgery, and that's beginning to catch on. It seems more descriptive. Exactly. It's more precise, and again, it, it really distinguishes between the identity in one's soul and sex. Sex is just what you do with what you're given. And yeah, absolutely. in your in, an, right. in in expressing intimacy with another person. Right. And that could be part of uh, why you would want to have the surgery to be sexually fulfilled in that way. But that is not uh, the only reason to have the surgery in, by any means. Yeah. In fact, it's probably one of the you know, seventh or eighth down the list, really. <laughs> right. Uh, for most people, it's, a, it's about reestablishing um, their identity and aligning their body with their soul. Mm. And uh, for almost everyone that I come in contact with, uh, there is a tremendous improvement in, in one's self-esteem when they go through the process of surgery. Mm. Well, I, it seems like we're in a culture of perfection. I mean, we want to fix everything that we see as imperfect. Do you think that this surgery is the fix to transgenderism? You say no, Nicole, why not? No, I would say no, because it's just one step in a process. Mm -hmm. um, transgenderism uh, causes several problems. A lot of transgender people I know suffer from depression, suffer, suffer some substance abuse, in an effort to get away from who they are, to try and mask who they are. So what? Um, Going through therapy helps people take away the layers, take away the fear, uh, take away the guilt that you feel uh, because recognizing the feelings I had, I, I suffered tremendous guilt for many years. I could not be like this. And I was a good Catholic boy. I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and it never went away. So it wasn't, having the surgery didn't cure anything, it didn't change anything. I felt I had gone through my transition before I had surgery. I had lived as a female for almost two years before I had surgery. Uh, my co-workers had accepted me, my family had accepted me, and the surgery was just another step. Mm -hmm. It didn't change anything for anybody else but me. Because mm -hmm. walking around on the streets, um, I can't tell what your gen genitalia is from here. Mm -hmm. So um, very, very, very few people will ever see my genitalia because it's mine and I'm not going to be showing it off all over the place because it's not what people do. And in fact, most of the time it's against the law. <laughs> so, you know, this surgery was strictly for me, mm. not for anybody else. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned the word perfection and I think 
you know, I think that becomes the, the holy grail for many people is, you know, we all want to be the best people we can possibly be. Sure. And uh, what, what is common to the histories of transgender people is that they grow up in a life that is, is based on deception and denial of oneself. And so Nikki mentioned uh, issues of drug abuse, um, substance abuse, uh, passive suicidal uh, ideation. Um, people take uh, very high-risk professions to, uh, as a way to escape, you know, the, the reality of dealing with who they are. So <clears throat> what the surgery really does for those people is, um, is alleviate that suffering. And uh, so it's a, it's, I mentioned, you know, so they do improve and they are getting closer to perfection um, in, in their own minds. Um, again, it's, it, it raises one's self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Do you think mm -hmm. that that can grow into an obsession of sorts where it's uh, not only changing the body, changing the face, and changing everything? Do you think that that can go overboard at all? Well, I think that's just a, a, uh, an extension of the um, uh, many of the societal <coughs> expect. Excuse me. <coughs> I think that's one of the problems with um, female expectations in society. Sure. In that um, the, there's such a focus for women on beauty that um, that you know, repeated surgeries, plastic surgery or whatever can for some people get out of hand mm. where, you know, where one surgery is simply isn't enough and then they want, they want to lift this and reduce that and suck this out and, you know, you know people where they just, they can't stop and they continue to get more and more surgery. But that's, that's true whether it's a transgendered female right. uh, or a, a natal female as well. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, Nicole, you said um, something about people can't tell just by looking or, you know, you can't tell what your genitalia looks like. And it seems that m most of the people I encounter say, well, I've never met anybody who's transgender. I've never even seen somebody who's transgender. Um, so the community itself seems almost invisible. Why, why do you think that is? Well, a lot of, a lot of um, transgender females, once they have surgery or once they get to a point in their transition, where they're adequately passable, mm -hmm. uh, frequently go what we call stealth, where they're able to change their driver's license, where they have a female uh, name on their license, they have a female picture on their license, and they have an F with a little section where it says sex. And they're able to do everything they can not to let anybody find out that they used to be a man. Or, on the other side, that they used to be a woman. Because there are female to male transsexuals and they pass just as well as male to female, if not better. Do you think that hurts the community in some way? I think so, because um, you don't know that the person at working behind the counter at Target is a transgendered female mm -hmm. or a transgendered male. It's just another individual. So that way so many people in society don't know that their, best, uh, their neighbor is a transgender person or that the person sacking their groceries or drilling their teeth mm -hmm. or giving out um, their drugs at the pharmacy is a transgender person. And it seems very similar to the gay and lesbian community in that you, you can very easily pass, or, or mm -hmm. some people mm -hmm. can pass, um, and because of that, a lot of times people don't realize how many of us there are mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, that, and that just comes out of fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fear to be different. Um, sometimes people will come out that they are transgendered and they lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. They lose friends, they lose mm -hmm. family. Um, it is a big change for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And fear causes people to try and go stealth or mm -hmm. hide it for so many years. Mm -hmm. More so than any other minority group. Mm -hmm. um, there's, tremendous penalty, there's a tremendous penalty in society for uh, outing yourself as a transgendered person today. Right. I mean, hopefully it's, I mean, it's getting mm -hmm. better because there's more understanding about the process. Mm -hmm. And you've been very public with your own um, transition in gender. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Well, I am, and I, I mean, I was and I wasn't. Um, <laughs> in, I transitioned publicly in a, in a very large uh, multi-specialty clinic in downtown Seattle as a practicing OBGYN. So you can, you can imagine that was about like, uh, that was <laughs> received like when Kennedy was shot. I mean, it was, people, know, people knew exactly where they were when it happened, when wow. they received my letter. 
And in fact, I, the funniest story I had about that was a, a, a patient of mine who, who received my letter saying I was transitioning from male to female, and she started screaming so loud that her cable repair guy fell off the roof and into some rose bushes. So, like, <laughs> So there are people that, that used to, for years, they would come in and say, oh, I got your letter at such and so, and I was doing this. You know, it was really something. So, so it was like very shocking to most people. It, it wasn't, it wasn't. People yeah. just don't, they didn't really read it until it was right in front of them. Mm -hmm. but, um, but by the end, I literally couldn't, I couldn't pass as a male if I tried to in public except for people that knew me as I was. And they just, mm -hmm. it's funny, they just didn't, they just didn't see it. Amazing. Yeah, but so, but after a time, um, word of my background, you know, I didn't wear a sign or anything around my neck, and I didn't wear, you know, a necklace or anything saying I was transgender. I was just a woman OBGYN, and and I, and I had a good reputation. And so eventually, my patients, um, through attrition and whatever, there's just turnover of patients. I had um, easily 60% of my practice um, really didn't know my background by the end. So and then I, um, and then I came out, as you would say, um, by assuming the roles of, of a transgender surgeon because there was no one behind great people like Dr. Stanley Biber, um, Dr. Schrang, and a few of the others who have courageously stepped out and done this surgery. There really, in this country, were very few surgeons. So someone needed to come in behind them. And then, of course, now with my public appearances and what have you, my pretty much my laundry is, you know, out there for everyone to see. Well, you put a face on transgenderism um, as well as every other part for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, a, a face and a bottom. A face and a bottom. <laughs> uh, and so in, in a lot of ways I think you're a role model for, for people who are wondering whether or not to come out because you've had fairly good positive responses. Um, so negative ones. Well, it's, well. It, it's hard. It's very hard um, living as a transgender person. And the, the, I think the most, the most disappointing part about it for me, um, you know, I really don't care. I'm a woman, and there's, I really don't consider myself transgendered anymore. Um, Ten years ago, yes, that's when I was going through it. But I'm a woman, and that's because society sees me as a woman, mm -hmm. and I'm treated in every way as a woman because I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. And, um, but. But when people know that you're a transgendered woman, uh, suddenly, you just, it just subtly, some people, many people, just treat you a little bit differently. You're just not on the same equality plane as someone who was born female. That's what I find so amazing about um, transsexual people in general is that you get to see both sides. You get to see what it's like to be a man. You get to see what it's like to be a woman, for better or for worse, the pros and the cons. Um, did you feel like it, it influenced or affected your practice? Oh, no question. Yeah. I mean, that was, you know, it's, it's interesting. But, I mean, the, as you say, we, ha we have a, a, a two-gendered perspective that is very, very powerful. Yeah. And it's very instructive for society. You know, I happen to believe it's a very positive uh, direction for society to explore. And uh, uh, I believe it's a, it's a sign that society is beginning to mature and explore deeper and more complicated aspects of human behavior. So I really see it as a positive movement and positive direction that people are coming out and uh, going this way. But my practice did change, mm -hmm. and, it, and it has a lot to do with, with, um, with uh, women's perceptions of their doctor and women's role in society. And um, as a, as a um, non-transsexual, as, as a biological male, and I was, I, was the, you know, I was kind of a golden boy in my little clinic and department chairperson and very, you know, very well thought of, but uh, I was a very busy surgeon. And it was interesting to me that my surgical practice was, was absolutely thriving, one of the busier in Seattle um, prior to transition. But after transition, um, my patient mix changed such that m more younger women came to me and um, women who wanted me as their caregiver and their obstetrician, but not necessarily as their surgeon. Yeah, I'm unbelievable. Isn't that funny? It's it just, is. So it's changing. I mean, women are now um, assuming more of a role in society, and you can see it shifting. 
um, and and uh, it's okay ceiling. now for but there's still a glass ceiling yeah right. or, or, the glass or, ceiling is still there oh no, uh, yes and becomes really apparent when you've made that transition very apparent yeah. so many things so many mm -hmm. aspects I'm sure Nikki you've had um, occurrences um, you know people now I find people will honk on me on the on the freeway much more readily when they see you know long blonde hair you know <laughs> I just kind of wave and you know just another ditzy blonde moment but no, but a well, lot of changes. Absolutely. Well, what do you see as the future of the transgender movement? Well, I'm working and pushing to get um, transgender people um, to recognize who they are publicly. Um, I work a lot with um, the Democratic Party, Stonewall Democrats, specifically Transgender Caucus, to try and let the, the, dem the political parties know that we're out here and we are a force to be reckoned with. I'm also working outspoken. Um, I love this program. I watched it before, and then I became a part of it. And working with the people behind the cameras, uh, working with you, uh, yelling at you as a floor <laughs> director, um, I think you found out that you know I'm just another person, and that's what really matters. And mm -hmm. trying to get a more transgender people to come out and say yes, I am a transsexual, or yes, I am a crossdresser, or yes, I am uh, intersex. Um, that it's not anything to be ashamed of. Mm -hmm. It's who you are. Accept it. Be proud, and come out and be a part of society. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the more people that come out, the easier it's going to be for the people who are after them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, as, very, as you say, it's very important to continue to bring the message to people, um, to reach people um, wherever they are. We, you know, we hope all people listen. Uh, of course, so many people have their, you know, you know, their, their eyes closed and their mind made up, but. Um, but little by little, it it um, it is it is working. Um, I think the thing I fear most, though, is the is the the current backlash we've had a little bit against um, the gay the LGBT movement um, from uh, the religious conservatives who use um, uh, biblical hypocrisy to to justify bigotry against. Um, alternatively gendered or sex people. It seems that as civil rights movements go on, uh, you do get more backlash the farther ahead you get, so maybe it's a good sign. <laughs> yes, that's right. Well, I, Woodrow Wilson actually, not, to, not that I'm a great, you know, <laughs> name dropper historian, but um, he actually gave his last speech in Pueblo, so this is how I happen to know this, but he said great causes have great enemies. Absolutely. Uh, he wasn't exactly a champion of, of women's rights, but um, but but that phrase kind of sticks with me. You described it well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank mm -hmm. you both for joining us tonight, and uh, it's been wonderful to sit with you and talk with you, and I hope you come back. Well, thank you, Fawn. I enjoyed the visit. Thank you. And I'll be back behind the cameras next time. Absolutely. <laughs> That's it for us tonight. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.